Hello everyone, welcome to the session. Today's topic of discussion is Introduction to Psychology of Education. The objectives of today's lesson are to understand and define the term psychology of education, to get a broad overview of the field of educational psychology and to understand the scope of this field of education. Before we understand and define educational psychology, let us first look at the two terms education and psychology separately. First, let us look at the word psychology. The term psychology is derived from two Greek words, psyche, which means soul, and logos, which means science or study. From this, we can define psychology as the study of the soul. Owing to the abstract nature of this definition, many psychologists try to refine and redefine the word psychology. After a series of changes in its definition, a clear and concrete definition of psychology was formed. Contemporary psychologists agree on the definition of psychology as the scientific study of behavior and mental processes of an organism wherein the mental processes refer to private and cognitive processes that happen in the brain such as perception, attention, memory, problem solving capacity, feelings, motives, decision making etc. Behavior refers to all actions and reactions of a being in response to external and internal stimuli which can be observed and measured scientifically. One's behavior is always influenced by his or her experiences. So, studying behavior also includes the study of a being's experiences. Now, let us see what the word education means. The word education is derived from a Latin word educare which means to bring up. Education is a process of imparting and acquiring knowledge and skills through instruction or study. It is simply an attempt to mold and shape behavior of learners in a school setting. It can also be defined as a process in which human behavior is altered or modified to bring about desirable changes in them. Now that we have understood the terms education and psychology separately, let us put them together to understand precisely what educational psychology means. Educational psychology is a consolidation of the two separate fields of psychology and education. This is a field of psychology with its own set of theories, perspectives, research methods, problems and techniques. This field of psychology makes an attempt to apply the knowledge and findings from psychology to the field of education. In other words, educational psychology is a study of the experiences and behavior of learners in relation to educational environment. Pioneers in this field have tried to define from different perspectives. Let us now have a look at a few of them. According to Skinner, educational psychology deals with the behavior of human beings in educational situations. Stephen defines it as the systematic study of the educational growth and development of a child. Jude calls it as the science which explains the changes that take place in the individual as they pass through the various stages of development. From all this definition, it is apparent that the field of psychology helps to in understanding the process of teaching and learning that takes place in an educational setting. This field studies in depth the learners and teachers behavior, their way of thinking, their actions as they learn and teach a particular curriculum. Apart from understanding the various nuances of teaching and learning, this field helps in developing instructional methods materials and testing tools in order to make teaching and learning 
more appropriate for a particular group of learners. W. A. Kelly postulated a few uses of educational psychology. Let us now have a look at them. It provides us with the knowledge of understanding the nature of learners. It illustrates the nature, aims and purposes of education and it helps in understanding the scientific methods and procedures which have been used in arriving at the facts and principles of educational psychology. This part of the session deals with the second objective that is to get a broad overview of the field of educational psychology. This field of educational psychology is new and an emerging one, but it started even before these terms were coined and researched upon. It started from the times of Aristotle and Plato, though it never was identified as a specific field of study in those days. Plato and Aristotle researched in the fields of education, training of the body, psychomotor skills and the possibilities and limits of moral education. Plato postulated that knowledge was an innate ability which is developed through experience and understanding of the world. After Plato and Aristotle, it was John Locke. He opposed Plato's theory of knowledge and introduced the term tabula rasa meaning blank slate. He believed that the mind was like a blank tablet and it grows and it forms knowledge from experience and learning. Locke explained that learning was primarily understood through experience only and we were all born without knowledge. Locke introduced this idea as empiricism or the understanding that knowledge is only built on learning and experience. This empiricism is now used as one of the criterions to test the validity of knowledge. Next is John Herbert. He is the father of educational psychology. He postulated conditions that would help learners in learning a subject matter thoroughly. These conditions were later developed into five steps of teaching formulated by his followers based on his principles. Herbert's five steps that need to be followed by teachers in order to be effective teachers are prepare the pupils to ready for the lesson, present the new lesson, associate the new lesson with ideas studied earlier, use examples to illustrate the lesson's major points, test pupils to ensure they had learnt the new lesson. After him, it was again in 1890 that the field of educational psychology took a leap and formed into a precise field of study. William James was the first in the field who conceptualized the theories of psychology and applied them to the field of education. He also stated that learners need to be trained in proper ways to learn. Apart from these, he also researched in the areas of attention, memory and association of ideas. The next advancement in the field of psychology was brought by Alfred Bennett. He tried to apply experimental designs in the field of education. He developed a test called bennett simon test to assess intelligence. This was first of its kind of intelligence test. This test was used widely to differentiate between gifted and underachieving learners. The aim of the test was to differentiate learners and teach them accordingly in the ways they would understand. With the rapid developments in the field, another major proponent emerged. It was Edward Thorndike. He postulated the famous law of effect. According to this law, learners would be able to make associations and strengthen these associations when it is followed by something pleasant. It would have a reverse effect if something unpleasant follows the association stage. His major contribution to this field of education was the development of standardized tests 
to measure the performance of the learners in various subjects at school level. His CAVD that stands for Completion Arithmetic Vocabulary and Directions Test is the first intelligence test that was multidimensional and it was the first test that used a ratio scale. A second major figure in the field of educational psychology is John Dewey. Many important ideas were postulated by him. He was the first educational psychologist who looked at learners as active participants in the classroom. Let us now have a look at the major principles of John Dewey. His major principle was that teachers should view learners as a whole and should emphasize on the adaptation of the child to the environment. That is, learners should not just be taught subjects matter, but they should be trained to think and they should also be trained to adapt themselves to the environment around them. Another proponent in the field is Jean Piaget. He developed the theory of cognitive development. This theory deals with the nature of knowledge, how people acquire it and how they construct knowledge. According to this theory, intelligence is developed through four stages. To Piaget, cognitive development was a progressive recognition of mental processes resulting from biological maturation and environmental experience. He believed that children construct an understanding of the world around them, experience discrepancies between what they already know and what they discover in the environment and then adjust their ideas accordingly. Child-centered classrooms and open education are the direct results of his theories postulated in the field of psychology. Next is Jerome Bruner, who advocated discovery learning based on Piaget's principles, where students are allowed to question, explore and experiment. Jerome Bruner was also responsible for the structuring of the subject matter in ways that was easy to understand by the learners. Benjamin Bloom was another pioneer in the field of educational psychology. He developed taxonomy of educational objectives. According to his taxonomy, there are three main domains, cognitive, affective and psychomotor. All these domains have a hierarchy of six levels. For example, in cognitive domain, there are six levels which are knowledge, comprehension, application, analysis, synthesis and evaluation. In the affective domain, there are five levels, receiving, responding, valuing, organizing and characterization. The final domain is the psychomotor domain. This is concerned with the things that learners can physically do. This domain was postulated by Bloom, but it did not compile the hierarchical levels under this domain. All these levels in each of the domains are arranged from simplest to complex levels. His taxonomy is widely used throughout the world to develop and expand curriculum, materials and teaching procedures. This taxonomy is also used in teacher training courses and in creating test materials appropriate for the level of learners. These are the major theories and influential people in the field of educational psychology. Now let us move to the third objective of today's lesson. The third objective for today's lesson is to understand the scope of this field. As we saw earlier that educational psychology deals with the behavior of humans in educational setting. The important features of this field is to identify different psychological factors affecting teaching and learning processes. This field defines and explains learning and teaching processes 
according to scientifically determined principles and facts concerning human behavior. Educational psychology addresses the question, why do some individuals learn more than others? And what can be done to improve that learning? Therefore, its subject matter is revolved around teaching and learning processes and educational psychologists attempt to discover that. There are five major factors that indicate the scope of this field. Let's now look at the screen to understand these five major factors. First is the learner, the learning experience, the learning process, the learning environment or situation and the teacher. Let us now look at all the factors in detail. First is the learner. The entire field of education is primarily concerned with this factor, that is, the learner. Educational psychology familiarizes us with the need of knowing the learners and the ways in which one can know and understand the learners in better ways. Primarily, it deals with the innate and inherent abilities and capacities of individual learners. Secondly, it deals with the comprehension and measurement of the individual differences in the learners in the form of their learning style, multiple intelligence, interest, motivation, etc. Apart from these inherent qualities and individual differences, this aspect of educational psychology also deals with the behavior of the learners. There are basically four different types of behaviors that are observed. The first one is overt behavior. Overt behavior are the actions or behavior that can be observed and can be seen readily in overt behavior. For example, singing or dancing. Second one is covert behavior. The actions and behavior that are internal in nature and which cannot be seen readily or easily observed are covert behavior. For example, feelings, thoughts, motives, learning, etc. The third behavior is conscious behavior. The actions and behavior that a learner is aware of is conscious behavior. For example, listening to the instructor, walking, eating, memorizing, etc. The fourth behavior is unconscious behavior. This includes the actions and behavior that the learner is not aware of. For example, mannerism, biting fingernails, shaking of legs while sitting, etc. All these along with their growth and development in each stage beginning from childhood to adulthood are factors of a learner that can be studied and researched upon to bring about the clarity in learning process. Next is learning experience. Educational psychology helps in deciding what learning experiences are desirable and what stage of growth and development of the learner so that these experiences can be acquired with a greater ease and satisfaction. After knowing the learner, one can understand what kind of experience that a learner would need to learn. These experiences need to be provided to the learners so as to make them learn with ease. The third one is learning processes. After knowing the learner and deciding what learning experiences are to be provided, then comes learning processes. Educational psychology moves on to the laws, principles and theories of learning. Other concepts in the learning process are remembering and forgetting, perceiving, concept formation, thinking, reasoning, problem solving, transfer of learning, ways and means of effective learning, etc. Next is learning situation or environment. It deals with the environmental factors and learning situations which come midway between the learner and the teacher. Topics like classroom climate, 
group dynamics, techniques and aids that facilitate learning and evaluation, techniques and practices, guidance and counselling, etc., which essentially help in the smooth functioning of the teaching learning process are discussed here. Another very important factor is the teacher. The teacher is the potent force is any scheme of teaching and learning process. This factor discusses the role of a teacher. It emphasizes the need of knowing thyself for a teacher to play his or her role properly in the process of education. A teacher's conflicts, motivation, anxiety, adjustment, level of aspiration, etc. In other words, a teacher's characteristic features that affect learning are focused upon. It essentially throws light on the personality traits, interests, aptitudes that characteristics of effective teaching, etc., so as to inspire them in becoming a successful teacher. Though the entire scope of educational psychology is included in the mentioned five key factors, it may have further expanded by adding the following. Educational psychology studies the growth and development of the child how a child passes through the various stages of growth and what are the characteristics of each stage are included in the study of educational psychology. To what extent heredity and environment contribute towards the growth of the individual and how this knowledge can be made use for bringing about the optimum development of the child form a salient feature in the scope of educational psychology. Educational psychology deals with the nature and development of personality of an individual. In fact, education has been defined as the all-round development of the personality of an individual. Personality development also implies a well-adjusted personality. It studies individual difference. Every individual differs from each other. It is one of the fundamental facts of human nature which have been brought to light by educational psychology. This one fact has revolutionized the concept and process of education. Educational psychology studies the nature of intelligence and its measurement. This is of utmost importance for a teacher. Thus, we saw how the five factors help us in determining the scope of educational psychology. Now let us look at the objectives of this field and how we can implement them in classrooms. To get a thorough knowledge of the nature of the learner, to provide an understanding of the nature, aims and purpose of education, to acquire familiarity with the jargon and to further understand and appreciate the scientific procedures those are used to collect the data and postulate the theories of learning and teaching, to provide a significant knowledge of developmental processes with particular emphasis on the promotion, guidance and control of mental and moral aspects, and to present the theories underlying the measurement and evaluation of mental abilities, aptitudes, achievements and interests. Now that we have reached at the end of the session, let's look at some of the major points that we discussed in this session. The session started off by giving out the objectives for today. The session then continued by defining the word educational psychology. Once a clear definition was formed, we moved to understand the history of this field. This helped us in getting an overview of this field, which formed the part of the second objective for today. Then, the session continued with the discussion on the scope of this field. The session finally ended with a list of broad objectives of the field of educational psychology. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.